everybody. It's so nice to be here at Malaprops, and it, it really does feel like Malaprops. Thank you <laughs> to Patricia and Stephanie and all of this wonderful bookstore. I know that we're very grateful in this community and, and I think around the country for what Malaprops is doing to keep book, independent book selling thriving. And uh, I'm really thrilled to see so many people in the audience and to see lots of old friends and acquaintances. I know that our presenters have them here too and people from as far afield as for Asheville as Colorado and Rhode Island. So welcome, great to see everybody. I'm a member of the UNC Press Advancement Council, which means that I just help rep represent UNC Press and this part of the state. And we've had a great time partnering with Malaprops to do this. Um, UNC Press is a very special institution. and I actually didn't know enough about it until I got involved in it. And I, I just can't um, tell you how thrilling it is to learn about it. So I want to share a little of, of that with you. UNC Press is about to be 100 years old in 2020. It is a very important state institution for North Carolina. It publishes 125 books a year, which if you think about it, is about a book every three days. And these are uh, extremely high quality books. Um, <clears throat> they are books that range from all kinds of academic scholarship to general interest reading. They cover not only North Carolina and the American South, but other topics and regions as well, with a huge selection of sociology, culture, um, literary studies, flora and fauna, and of course, lots and lots of books about hiking, which we especially like to have right now in Western North Carolina. So this is an institution that carries the state's name not only through our region, but really around the world. About half of the books that are published by UNC Press um, win major awards, and these awards include the Pulitzer Prize in History, the National Book Award, the Bancroft Prize, and many others. And this evening, you're gonna have a great treat hearing Brian Simon talk about his new book in conversation with Elizabeth Gillespie McRae. So I wanna introduce these two presenters really very quickly. You'll learn a lot more about them from them. But um, I wanna give a little bio because they both have extremely interesting careers. Uh, Bryant Simon is a graduate of UNC, so uh, another UNC connection, and uh, now a professor of history at Temple University. His previous books include studies of, and I really love this um, range of topics. I think you're going to enjoy it too. Studies of Atlantic City and Starbucks. And his commentary has appeared in the Washington Post, the New Republic, Christian Science Monitor, and the Raleigh News and Observer. He is currently an Organization of American Histor Historians Distinguished Speaker, which I'd love to hear more about. Um, and the president of the Southern Labor Studies Association. And he loves Malaprop's bookstore, as all of us do. His presenter tonight, um, his colleague and in presenting will be Elizabeth Gillespie McRae, who is an associate professor of history at Western Carolina University, not too far away, and the author of Mothers of Massive Resistance, White Women and the Politics of White Supremacy, which I also very much want to read soon. Winner of the OAH's 2018 Frederick Jackson Turner Award and the SHA's Frank and Harriet Osley Award. She is also a longtime fan of Malaprops. And please welcome these two outstanding authors, instructors, and presenters. Thank you. Um, I'm really honored to be talking with um, Bryant tonight about um, his recently released paperback, The Hamlet Fire, 
I must say, however, this is a poor substitute for um, how I normally get to visit Bryant in Western North Carolina, which would either have us in Cullowhee and at Malaprops and maybe going to hear the drive-by truckers afterwards. Um, but we'll have to wait for the next book um, and the next time, um, hopefully to do all three of those. I feel like Bryant's histories, you might notice I have on my shelf, um, that Bryant's histories um, have lots to teach us and they seem to sort of recirculate in the public conversation to remind us of important lessons, roads not taken and possibilities. Um, his first book, Fabric of Defeat, published by UNC Press, looked at Southern, um, South Carolina textile workers in the New Deal and examined among other things, the politics of masculinity and white supremacy and that certainly bears rereading um, currently. His book on Atlantic City charted the rise and decline um, of the city and featured um, our current president in a way that um, could have been very instructive. And the Hamlet Fire, um, Starbucks too, but the Hamlet Fire is no different as it speaks to both the history and bears contemplation, I think also in light of um, the world we find ourselves in today. So Brian, maybe we could start um, with you just telling us um, what happened at Imperial Food Products in Hamlet, North Carolina, um, and then why you decided to tell this story. Yeah, sure. But first, thanks to Malaprops, really one of my favorite bookstores. Um, and a shout out to all independent bookstores, which are really um, critical institutions. And I think we've been reminded of that again and again, how much we miss them um, in recent days. But they're still here, right? And thanks to you, Lib. It's nice to be with you. Um, so yeah, the Hamlet fire, um, the fire itself really takes us to this small town in North Carolina, Hamlet, North Carolina, a town of about 6,000 people, the birthplace of John Coltrane and Tom Wicker, the famed New York Times journalist, who actually both were born in 1926 in Hamlet. And Hamlet, again, is this, this small railroad town about um, two hours south of Raleigh and two hours east of Charlotte where on September 3rd, 1991, the day after Labor Day, workers um, came to work like they always did around seven o'clock in the morning. They got there and they found out that work was gonna be delayed that morning for a little while, and learning that um, there was a problem with an, a hydraulic line. And you know they were sitting there catching up from the weekend, getting their predictable kind of limited protective gear on, though they probably didn't call it that at the time, and were told to, to get to work. And they, they were working for about 20 minutes. Um, and all of a sudden they heard this massive blast, right? This kind of explosion. And they wouldn't know this at the time and no one told them this, but that hydraulic line had been fixed with the wrong parts. And it, uncoupled itself as soon as it was turned on and it spewed highly flammable, really inexpensive um, liquid all over the place, including under the burners that cooked the chicken tenders that the plant made and fried them up um, before they sent them the Shoney's and Long John Silver's. And that burner was unprotected. And, and a theme should be developing here about the risk that was sort of everywhere in this plant. And so as, as the fire just kind of um, exploded and literally exploded um, and, and created so much heat that it blew a hole in the roof of this factory, the workers scurried to the exits. And what many of them found were that the exits were locked. In one case, one, one of the exits was double bolted from the outside. And in another case, workers pushed the door out, not knowing that the door pushed in. Several workers, um, 11 in all, went into a cooler hoping that the, that, the, that the chill of that space would protect them against the fire, only to learn that there, that was one of the doors that didn't close and carbon monoxide leaked into that cooler and killed 11 people in there. All in all, 25 people died that morning. None of them needed to die. They, they would have survived pretty easily even this horrific fire if um, they had, the doors had just been opened. And, you know, I learned about this fire like many people did. Um, I was living in North Carolina at the time. I was finishing up my dissertation. I lived in Raleigh and I learned about the paper every morning from the News and Observer and the Charlotte Observer. And 
most people in the audience who are, are my age can remember just what great papers they were. And in some ways, the fire proved their, their mental mantle. They wrote with such grace and power and concern that, that the event stayed with me really um, until the kind of early 1990s. And I've told this story before, but um, a graduate student of mine came into my office, was kind of looking for a dissertation topic. And I began to tell him the story of the Hamlet fire. And I got about halfway through and I said, you know, we're gonna have to find you something else. Um, I think this is the story I want to write now. And um, so, you know, this is the story I wrote. And, and in many ways, the, the story kind of, as you know, it kind of builds on the fact that the fire really didn't begin that morning in, uh, in September 1991, that the origins of the blast were much deeper. And, and those origins really challenged the narrative that existed at the time that this was an accident. So the book is really about the structures um, around the idea of cheap that kind of brought those people there that day, made them vulnerable and risked their lives so that other people could eat really inexpensive and falsely priced chicken tenders. Well, um, I think when I've heard you talk about this book before and you see the, uh, and you're with the um, audience as they leave and one of the common reactions is like, oh, I'm not gonna eat chicken again. <laughs> and so I think the cheap food that's part of your subtitle, right, often um, is kind of an initial reaction, right? And, and the cheap lives that are lost. But the other um, part of the subtitle is cheap government. And so I guess, um, following up on your um, notion that it wasn't an accident. It wasn't an accident, even though, right, the reporters that you interviewed said that it was an accident. Can you talk about the multiple levels where this devotion to cheap um, created the Hamlet fire that um, destroyed these workers' lives? But um, it's also emblematic of a larger destruction, I think, in American society. Yeah, I mean, I suspect um, around nine o'clock tonight, maybe at nine ten tonight, we'll hear something about the the um, merits and the necessity of deregulation. Um, I think it'll come early and maybe often tonight. And in some ways, Ham Hamlet is a story of deregulation. It's what it really looks like on the ground. And so this plant, it was called Imperial Food Products. Again, it made inexpensive chicken tenders it sold for $1.99 fries and a drink included at Shoney's and it, what's interesting about this plant is before the 1991 fire there had been three fires in that plant and the head of the fire department had never been inside of it he never bothered to go inside that plant and check out what was going on this plant moved from Pennsylvania from Moosic Pennsylvania to Hamlet in the early 1980s in many ways, trying to run away from OSHA, the um, regulatory agency that's supposed to protect the safety of workers. And nobody from Pennsylvania OSHA notified North Carolina OSHA that a serial violator was in their midst. And, and perhaps most remarkably, the state of North Carolina in 1991 was the most industrialized state in the country per capita. Um, you know, those of you who've driven the back roads of North Carolina know this. It's something that I think most people who live where I live don't know. And it had 180,000 um, workplaces, but it only had 40 people, roughly, who were certified to inspect those factories. So just break this down for a second. If they visited one factory a day, five days a week, every day of the year, let's just say they never took a vacation because I couldn't figure the math in of them doing a vacation. That would take them 72 years to inspect every factory in the state. That meant that Emmett Rowe could lock the doors in the back of his plant to either keep flies out or to keep workers from stealing things without ever have, having to worry if anyone would come to check on those places. That's what deregulation looks like. That's what made those workers vulnerable that day, a kind of indifference to their lives in the sake of profits that was crucial to North Carolina's industrialization. And in many ways, I would argue, a, a model of industrialization that North Carolina helped pioneer for the rest of the country. You know, I think the part of the story here is, is 
is not that the South is behind the North, that actually the South is emulating a model that the rest of the country will adopt. Oh wait, I can't hear you, Lib. Okay, okay. It's my fault. In April of this year, um, food processing workers were declared essential workers, yeah. but treated as dispensable. Can you talk about this history of forgetting and erasure or the alarming echoes between um, the conditions surrounding the workers at Imperial Food and today? Yeah, sure. I, I, like, it's really interesting. Part of what I think that the, that you know, the model of cheap that, that Hamlet relied on and was silence, right? In many ways, it relied on a model, um, this is a little bit of a mixed metaphor, but that hid people, right? And made them sort of unseen and that the profits was in that unseen. But what was really interesting about this kind of initial moment of the pandemic was that workers in this country were seen for the first time you know, really since the 1930s. I mean, I mean, I don't, I think many of us would strain to remember another time where people walked out in the streets to applaud work in this country. Um, and so that was like the really interesting moment uh, of COVID, but at the same time, the government in the very kinds of processing plants that I write about essentially locked the doors on workers. It made meatpacking workers who work shoulder to shoulder essentially have to sort of compromise their health in order to survive. I mean, when, when, when the government announced that it was gonna keep the plants open, it essentially locked the doors on those workers and said, you will be unhealthy so that the rest of us can eat this relatively cheap and inexpensive product. And their bodies had been sacrificed. I mean, look, this, this is not to get an argument about like meat-based protein, but it's that you can't eat industrial produced meat-based protein and not eat something that will challenge the bodies of the people who make it. I mean, it just, it, it isn't possible, right? And either in the long term and the short term, right? That is inherent in the system. And what, again, what you saw during the pandemic is essentially the government locking the doors on those workers. And, and now, quite interestingly, they're unseen again. Um, I know in my own neighborhood at, um, and, and Libby, you know the story, but my own neighborhood at seven o'clock every um, night at the kind of height of the pandemic, people cheered um, frontline workers in the healthcare profession. I live near several hospitals, but my partner who works in a hospital, their numbers are down and her job is in jeopardy. Um, almost that quickly, right? That, that sort of silence has become yet again, like our frame for viewing work in this country. And, and, and that becomes the ticket to a certain kind of profit. I'm also interested, or maybe you can talk a little further about sort of the deep dive that you did in the book into Hamlet, um, the place, and what the place, um, and maybe this builds on how North Carolina emulates or becomes emulated, but that Hamlet as a place speaks to the fate of sort of communities and working class, um, the nature of work and working class people, and also kind of the precariousness or elusiveness of prosperity in the 20th century um, and today. So I'm wondering maybe you just talk about Hamlet as like the fate of Hamlet as a place. <laughs> Hamlet, um, Hamlet in many ways is um, a central character in the book. It, it um, and, and I treat it almost like a character and like all characters, it changes, right? And, and that's crucial to the story. Any of you have ever been to Hamlet, the focus of the town is this really beautiful um, early 20th century railroad, railroad depot with um, kind of amazing and elaborate Victorian kind of woodwork in the top of it. And that symbolizes the kind of essential place that the railroad played in Hamlet. And well, that has made Hamlet in some ways a place that people, railroad buffs go back to all the time. It actually speaks to a kind of deeper reality about Hamlet Hamlet was not so much a Southern town, but an American town in the sense for much of the 20th century, it had a single industry, a unionized industry that provided working people with good jobs, the kinds of jobs that allowed them to buy a house, that allowed them to take a vacation, that allowed them to send their kids to college, 
And as somebody pointed out to me, made Hamlet the town with the most backyard swimming pools per capita in North Carolina. That symbol, right, of kind of working class prosperity. And that kind of dripped through the town, right? It was a town with pretty good schools for much of the 20th century. It was a town with a really good hospital. People would come from Charlotte to go to Hamlet Hospital. It was a town where people were healthy, where um, for better or worse, you know, men made a living ways and their partners could stay at home. And really what happened in the 1970s like happened in so many other parts of America and industrial America, that industrial fabric in Hamlet started to fray. And eventually it began to totally kind of found itself in tatters, right? And interestingly enough, that happens at the moment that African-Americans get their first entree into these jobs, as it, again, as it happens in so many other places. So by the early 1980s, Hamlet was like so many other places in the United States, a place starving for jobs, starving for industries that would pay revenues to support the basics of town. And so meanwhile, in Pennsylvania, Emmett Rowe, the owner of Imperial Food Products, who was struggling with the union, struggling with profitability, struggling with OSHA, was flipping through the pages of a kind of, um, of a real estate book. And he saw this shuttered ice cream plant in Hamlet. And he did what any kind of employer would do. He went and looked up the statistics. And he found out that Hamlet by the middle, by the 1980s, was no longer a place of high wages, no longer a place of robust health. It was a place sad, you know, kind of sad and down on its luck, exactly the kind of place he'd want, exactly the place where people would be begging for jobs that paid just above minimum wage, exactly the kind of place where people wouldn't complain, not because they didn't recognize inequity, because they feared losing their job. That was the kind of place that would allow him to produce things cheaply, and that's why he came to Hamlet. Um, I think often um, when historians write about a tragic event, right, the characters get frozen in time, right? It's there, like, it's the build up to that moment. Um, and what they did and what they did afterwards kind of um, fades away. But are there stories, and I think um, that you'd like to share that talk about the lives of some of the workers or some of the folks involved in the Hamlet fire, like post Hamlet fire, the townspeople. It, it, is there a particular story that um, illustrates the sort of long, the long shadow of the Hamlet fire in somebody's life? So the, the first part about the shadow is, 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 is actually somewhat more than metaphoric in the case of Hamlet. Um, and, and I think it, it will help us sort of think about some of the stories that I learned and some of the, the stories that, that happened. The plant um, was on a kind of a little bit of a raised hill that was on the black side of town um, in Hamlet. And, and Hamlet was a place in 1991 where the civil rights movement kind of mattered and kind of didn't matter, but it was still segregated. And after the fire, the, the, the plant is burnt, it's charred, it has yellow tape, there's containers that they were put in the fried products are littered across the lawn. And that plant stood there for not just one year, not just two years, but for 10 years after the fire. And if you think about what that means, is that meant that every time someone in that part of town wanted to drive to the grocery store, the Piggly Wiggly in town, they wanted to go take their kids to school or to baseball practice, or they wanted to leave town, they had, to, they had to go by the plant, that plant that had tortured them, that plant that had killed somebody they knew, that plant that really, that never reopened and, and kind of shaped their lives. And, and so, you know, one of the things that was really interesting about reading, you know, sort of thinking about the, the aftermath of the fire was really thinking about PTSD. Uh, many of the people themselves suffered with it. And you know this, Lib, that I had suffered loss. And my mom was going through PTSD, like, while well, I was writing this. And um, so, like, a lot of that made a lot of sense to me. And, and those stories kind of amplified out. Like, there were people who really suffered, like, struggled with drug addiction, um, people who killed family members because they were so traumatized by the fire. In one case, I'm, and, and it's just a, a crazy story. Um, the 25th victim of the fire was the guy, was the Vance, the Lance delivery man. Those of you who know what Lance is, they were the kind of cheap version of 
you know, vending products. And he normally delivered on Mondays, but because it was Labor Day, he was there that Tuesday, right? And um, he gets trapped in the fire. Uh, uh, somebody pulls his body out and hands him down to his son who didn't know he was there that day and was um, a first responder. Well, the son, really his life just went off the rails. He eventually um, murdered his wife and, and, and tried to sink her in a lake um, near town. And there, there's more than one of these stories. So like, so those stories sort of speak to the tragedy of it. But then there's like these really quiet victories that were um, kind of amazingly, like amazing to, to, to read about them. Um, there's a lot in the book about how workers are trying to get like this settlement money after. And this one woman, what she wants is enough to buy a house and put a piano in it. And she does. She buys a house, puts a piano in it, and as part of her therapy, writes a moving memoir of the fire. And that memoir was inspired by, I think another kind of quiet here of the book was a psychologist by the name of Stephen Fry. And Stephen Fry um, was essentially imagined, I think, by the insurance company as a patsy. Um, in order to collect money for suffering from PTSD, you had to go see a psychologist. But the insurance companies in North Carolina could often name the provider. I, I think some of you might know this. They named this guy. And he had, what was amazing is he just threw himself into the work. He estimated that he drove back and forth to Hamlet some like 2,000 times from Charlotte. And he treated people. He tried to get them to see that the world wasn't against them. And um, the people who, who went to Fry were better off for it. And so, you know, they're, they're, you know it's like those dimensions of the story are really, um, I mean, you were asking me the question. Yeah, they're part of like the telling of that story. Um, much of... Yeah, much of what I appreciate about your um, scholarship and writing is how much we learn about the people and the places in your books. And I guess it's worth saying that I, um, Bryant was one of my first teachers in a PhD program. And I still have papers that he marked up, right? Imploring me to write better and stop lecturing um, to my readers. and. Um, I hope it took, it hasn't taken as much as, um, I still don't write as well as he does. Um, but I think um, oftentimes um, the humanity, and I think we saw this in you talking of the people that you write about um, comes through. And oddly, and I don't know if you wanna read or just talk about this, um, in this book, it's your writing about the, victims' bodies where I find their humanity most salient. Like the most sort of raw part of the book for me was reading um, when you wrote about the sort of um, the, from the death certificate. So I didn't know if, um, this is a really dark question, but if you would talk about sort of your decision to write it that way or just read us a section and talk about like what made you um, set up the chapter around those stories. Well, why don't we keep it upbeat? I'll just read it. All right. Um, <laughs> and we can, um, so this is the beginning of a chapter called Bodies. And it begins like this. An archivist for the state of North Carolina tucked the death certificates for the victims of the Imperial Food Products Fire away in an ordinary looking government building in Raleigh, not far from the state house and the governor's mansion. The records are contained in a single gray folder. The only place to sit and go through them is a clunky heavy metal desk in a windowless room. The names of the dead are listed one per page. Each report contains the information you'd expect to find on the death certificate. Each lists the last known address, each notes their age, marital status, how much schooling they had, and the time, place, and cause of death. Though filled with clinical language, these records possess an eerie intimacy. They include a glossy headshot of the victim and a generic sketch pinpointing the spot of every scrape, pockmark, bruise, burn, and soot stain found on each body. The examiners discovered a noted needle bar marks running up and down both arms of one of the dead. He tried to hide his habits from his coworkers with bandages. The medical examiners listed in detail what the victims wore on their bodies at the time of their deaths. 
Brenda Gail Kelly had on bl a blue shirt, white jeans, and white shoes. She had a bow in her hair. Michael Allen Morris had on rubber boots and a black t-shirt with the words, I survived Hugo, a hurricane that blew through the Carolinas in 1989, killing dozens of people and causing billions of dollars in damages written, written across the front. At the time of the fire, Donald Bryce Rich had on blue denim overalls and a dark t-shirt proclaiming his allegiance to the Holy Trinity of women, wine, and overtime. Underneath his clothes, he had a collection of tattoos on his arms and shoulders, depicting a skull and dagger, a grim reaper, a lightning bolt, and a cobra riding on flaming wheels that said Mary. Scotland County's Rose Lynette Wilkins had a rose tattoo and nothing in her pockets. Many of the dead still had on their blue smocks and white aprons. Some wore rings and watches, and several of the women had painted their finger and toenails bright red in one case. Medical examiners dug into the pockets of Josephine Barrington. Emptying her pants, they found bifocals, red um, hair clips, nail clippers, scissors, a small tin of Tylenol, a purse containing three $5 bills, three $1 bills, 91 cents and change, a ring with seven keys, and a few chicks, sticks of chewing gum. Doing their jobs with characteristic thoroughness, the medical personnel jotted down the color and material of the bras and underwears the victims wore. They recorded whether um, or not they were circumcised and if their teeth were fully intact or they relied on dentures. Before returning their bodies to the undertakers in their hometowns of Ellerby, Laurenburg, Rockingham, and Hamlet, the examiners pressured um, measured the precise length and exact weight of the naked bodies. They wrote down the numbers in the designated boxes on the death certificates. Why, why did I choose to? Uh, I mean, the one thing, um, I'll just say one thing. I got this advice from my friend Grace Hale while I was um, writing the book. And her, she said, she wrote me in a note. She told me to challenge your inner Hemingway. And what she was kind of reminding me to do, and I and I sort of tried to keep that in mind, that the the story was profoundly sad and didn't need any embellishment, and 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 so like in that case, like I knew that was, I just knew that to describe it was that that nothing else needed to be done, and and so trying to find a voice that was a little flatter was something I I worked on throughout the whole book. Well, while we're talking about writing, I think there's lots of writers in the audience and maybe they're as interested in process and method um, as I am. Could you talk about um, your process um, sort of generally and if you have any stories, to, well, I know you do, we've talked about this. If you have any story about how the sort of cheapness that you write about also affected um, your research and maybe will affect the, the ways we tell stories in the future. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, process, I still write by hand on legal pads, um, not, you know, just because it works. Um, and I, I, I don't write the beginning last, I write the beginning first. Um, so it takes me a long time to start, but then I, I kind of know what I'm doing. Um, again, it, that as process works for me. Um, but, but I think there was one moment in my research that began um, began to let me think about like cheap in another um, shape or form. And so I knew that um, the day after the fire, the relatively feckless labor department of the state of North Carolina sent um, investigators to Hamlet. And I knew that they interviewed um, anybody they could in town. And when I went to ask the Department of Labor if I could have the records, they said no. And when I reminded them that they were obligated to give me the records under the state under state law, they said no. And um, I actually ended up hiring a lawyer. And, you know, basically he got paid. He wrote like a kind of letter threatening a lawsuit if they didn't release the documents. And um. I thought about this story and it's actually, um, it's the, the, the moral of the story is more prosaic than profound. They, they didn't bury the records because they were embarrassed what was in them. They buried the records because they were so underfunded they didn't have anybody to process them. And there's this interesting dynamic I think happening now that, that people who write about the recent past have to be, I think, aware of. And that is 
Well, documents have proliferated, information has proliferated. At the same time, budget cuts have meant that almost no agency has the personnel to actually process them. And so I actually think this is something that's really going to threaten the writing of the past as we move forward, right? That, that these documents are, are, are going to go un sort of cataloged. And it's already starting to happen. If you begin to do history of the recent past in a strange way, the government records are less accessible than if you write about the middle of the 20th century or the early part of the 20th century. And why is this? It's because of cheap government. It's because government is not funded to the point that it can fulfill the mandates that the law says it should. I can't hear you. Liz. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I think I have time for one sort of last questions before we open it up for audience questions. But um, what would you like um, if you could control it for your readers to take away from their interaction with this book? I don't think, I, you know, I don't think I would want one thing to be the thing, you know, I mean, like part of what's kind of amazing about writing a book is the different things people take away from them. And so like, you know, part of me would say, well, I want you to sort of recognize that the world we live in needs to be changed, right? And that we need to not live in a world where people need to die in order to make the kind of basic necessities that we want to eat, and they don't need to become unhealthy to make those. And people need to make more money. Yeah, that would be great. But also, you know, part of the magic of writing a book is when people come away with something that you didn't even imagine. And um, like, I got one like really like small indication of this. I was talking to a class recently had read my book. And apparently I was talking about the ice cream plant that that had existed where the factory was. And I used the word scooped in a sentence. And I had no recollection of that. And they found that, but like, it's like the little things like that you love to engage readers with, right? Um, or, you know, the, the kind of small lines that, you know, maybe I wrote to you or, or to another friend of mine or to, you know, to my kids that only they would get, you know, there's like so many different levels of, of pain and joy in writing a book that I don't know. I, I don't think I would say one thing, like the politics are obvious about the book. But beyond that, I, I think it's it's that kind of interesting process that I guess I like about a book, though, even even though it, it, it rarely shows itself. Right. I mean, that's the weird thing about writing a book is you you write it for painfully for a long time and then you have two weeks in like sunshine and then it goes back to the kind of you go back to your cave. Um, Stephanie, do we want to move on to audience questions at this point? Sure, we'll go ahead and get started with that. Uh, so, looks like, so it looks like uh, I, if I could, I would like to ask a, a question. And then we have uh, some, uh, I think one question that's sort of expansive. And if you want to, audience members, please post your questions in the uh, chat and uh, we'll get to those too. So my question for you, Bryant, has to do with process. Uh, it's a process question. Uh, how do you think your, how do you think the uh, issue of race has shape, shaped your research? Do you think that it came into your research and what sources did you particularly use to get at that particular subject? So this is, I think, you know, for me, writing about the past is always writing about the moment you're living in. I mean, I already referred to that once. And um, I wrote this book against the backdrop of Ferguson, against the backdrop of Eric Gardner. And so I wrote it against the backdrop of Black Lives Matter in, in, in a lot of ways. And um, one story, one moment when that all became clear was um, when I put a couple of things together, the majority of the people who worked in the factory 
um, were, were black women, many of them single moms, um, probably 70 to 75% of them were, were black women. And um, I was talking to a, a middle class, upper middle class um, white woman. Um, I was interviewing her about the fire and she said to me, before the fire, I didn't even know the plant was there. Well, Hamlet's a town of 6,000 people. Um, it was, the Imperial was the largest employer in private employer in the town by, you know, how many fold, I don't even know it by that point, right? And um, the kind of absence of that what spoke to me, right, to, to part of what made the people who worked in the plant vulnerable, right? Their invisibility to the, they wanted the revenue from the plant, but nobody wanted to see the people who worked in that plant and they didn't want to recognize their lives. And so um, I think that interview was real, like those two things together were really crucial for me, like putting that part of the story, start putting that part of the story together. You know, and I, and, and I think, um, thinking about the story about race, like there was no way to think about it as anything else. Um, I interviewed um, a fair number of people who survived the fire and, and the majority of them were, were black and um, they couldn't, you know, there was no telling of their stories in which race wasn't not central. It just was everywhere, right? And, and so um, I, I, don't, I don't think even the people in this plant would have been made vulnerable in the same way if it was a, major, a plant of majority white women. Um, I, I think, so it, there was no way to tell it without race really at the center of it and without thinking really fundamentally about the way in which um, kind of a word that I probably didn't use at the time or think about at the time, but that, that systematic racism wasn't always in play. Um, and, and both away from work and at work. I think that's an interesting issue when we're looking at historiography and what creates, uh, you know, how the time and the context for the production of a work like yours and, and all works of history uh, shapes and informs what you're doing. I, I would say one other thing to say, kind of deliberately and very, um, I, I, don't, I don't think I use more than twice the word civil rights movement. I, and, and part of that was a really deliberate um, intention not to obscure it, but also not to sort of elevate it as a kind of central moment in the history of Hamlet, like a lot of small places in the South. And that was to me another way to kind of make race part of the story. There's, oh, oh sorry, there's, uh, did you want to add something Libby? No, no, I was gonna ask him the question from Farah. Go ahead. Um, so, um, Brian, a student of um, Kat Sharon's at NC State has written a question, Farah Arnold, and she wondered that our uh, comment earlier, you touched on silence and how it informed the model of Cheap and Hamlet. Um, how did that influence your choice to name um, chapter two silence and, and maybe a larger question about sort of the naming of your um, chapters in this book? Um, hi, Farah. Um Th thanks for reading the book. You tell Kat I said hi. Um, so um, I don't know, you know, I just um, naming the chapters, I got this idea I was going to give them single word. I mean, I had one that was a single word, and then I figured I better name everyone a single word. And um, anyone who reads a lot of academic writing knows that our titles can be really long. And, and then we make long titles and longer chapter titles. And I was a little bit trying to get away from that model of, of, of um, to try and sort of point to a kind of economy. Um, um, and, and then the second part of the question was um, the like how silence is part of the story. Well, so I actually think that um, silence and I would, I would count deregulation as a form of silence um, is absolutely crucial to the North Carolina model of industrialization that is, is like showcased in Hamlet. And that is that, will things look cheap, all the costs and all the risks are hidden. And um, all the environmental risks are hidden, all the cost to people's bodies are hidden. And, in, and, and so, well, that chapter is really about the kind of way in which the guy Emmett Rowe who bought the factory 
wants to sort of make sure he can run the factory with any, without any intervention from anyone as possible, deregulation and kind of the complicity of town managers. It's also about the way in which workers in some ways are forced and almost complicit, they, they're silenced by it. And I tell the story of this woman um, who worked in the plant. She grew up um, in Rockingham, the town next to it and moved for a time actually to not far from where I live here in West Philadelphia. And she came back and, you know, she sort of imagined herself as someone who had acquired a voice while moving out of the South. And she'd also kind of matured and grown up in those years. And um, she gets a job at Imperial, you know, she'd worked there a couple of days and like, you know, this place sucks. Like the work's bad, you know, I'm, I'm cold all day long. My hands are freezing. How do you, how do you put up with this? And they, they, her coworkers say to her, you can't say anything. You want to lose your job, fine, but I'm not going to risk talking to you because this is the only job I have. This is the only way I can support my kids. And, and what I was in that story made a real impression on me about the way in which this system was locking people in, right? And creating a kind of way that perpetuate the si system and couldn't get, couldn't find their way out of it. And so I want to, like, that, that was the kind of, level and register of silence I was trying to get at here. We have another question from Elizabeth Colton. Thanks you. Um, and she wondered at what point did you realize that Hamlet was a main character? Was it from the beginning? Was it during? And how did that realization affect your um, telling of the story? So thanks, Elizabeth. So I initially, you know, probably not surprisingly, the, the book the, the, the book that sat as kind of a model on my desk was the book Triangle, a really amazing book about the Triangle Waste Shirt Factory Fire. And, and um, I'm like a huge fan of J. Anthony Lukash. Like I wanted to write a, a narrative and I wanted and I thought, Part of the reason why when I was telling earlier, as I was telling this story to my student and I wanted to write this, um, I wanted to write a kind of narr a piece of narrative nonfiction that, you know, kind of was chronological in a sense, right? And, and that was my goal, right? Somehow I was going to tell this story, you know, in a chronological fashion. And it just occurred to me as I was kind of doing that, that I don't know, it didn't work. And so um, if you read the book, you'll, you'll know, I, I basically tell the whole story in the first eight pages of the fire. And I came to, to feel like a more powerful way of telling the story was then in a sense like this, but the, the, uh, you know, the kind of model on my desk switched to this book by Eric Kleinenberg called Heat Wave, which he calls a social autopsy of an event. And so then I was like, kind of pull apart like the real causes of the fire. And so each chapter became a single word, but really kind of like a deeper cause, right? That that sort of added to this moment. And um, I would go backwards and kind of end up at the fire again. That was like the kind of way that I decided to do it. And then it became really clear to me that Hamlet was the key character at like launching the story, or at least that's the way, one, it, I needed to get there somehow, right? Um, and I kind of wanted it to be about well, and Hamlet was really interesting because it allowed me actually almost immediately to recognize that this wasn't, despite the kind of name Hamlet, you know, both the Faulkner kind of part of it and the kind of every place part of it was actually typical of something else. And I said this before, a kind of larger model of the American economy in the post-war period, really, that it had more almost in common with Detroit than it did with, you know, a, a county in Mississippi. And so... Then I really wanted like to place the town at the real beginning of it. And so that the action really then began with the collapse of its economy. Like so many other stories that would dominate the 1990s this collapse in the 1970s. And so it was that, that kind of thinking that got me to put Hamlet at the very, at, at the real start of the story. Um. Jerry has a question about what your reaction was to hearing um, the order um, that the chicken plants be reopened early in the COVID days in spite of the risk of workers and in spite of the number of positive COVID cases. Um, 
I guess, Jerry, I wish I could say that I was surprised. Um, but, but, you know, there's, there's a long tradition, right, of sacrificing work for our consumption. And that, like, that argument is really at the heart of the story I tell. And, and, and there's a kind of moment, I think, that, that makes that really clear in the book. And, and I'll get back to this kind of current moment. So there's a lot written about the doors being locked at the back of the plant. And the story that was told in the newspapers at the time, or at least somewhat at the time, was that the owners locked the doors to keep workers from stealing chickens. This did a lot of work, Patricia, racially as well, to stigmatize workers. But really, the reason why the doors were locked was, and this is a crazy part of the story, OSHA never walked in the plant, but the USDA was in there every day. So the government was in there inspecting the meat, but they refused to report on the conditions. And they, or, they came to a deal with the owners of the plant to lock the back doors to keep flies out away from the chicken. And this to me was a kind of, a, you know, it's kind of an amazing story, but I, I think it actually speaks to the question you're asking, right? The government has been more interested in protecting consumers, sort of, than it has in workers for a long time in this country. And so really what the reason why chicken workers were ordered back into dangerous chicken plants was to make sure that consumers had cheap chicken. And I don't, I, I guess I, I, I'm not surprised by that. Um, I, I'm, and, and I'm not, and you know, frankly, this won't be part of the debate tonight. I mean, there's no doubt Pence will defend deregulation, but, and Harris might make a nod to unions but she's not going to defend a revitalized OSHA or an OSHA that not revitalized, a vitalized OSHA. OSHA was underfunded for the very beginning. She's not going to say, look, we are going to build a country where workers are protected and their safety is guaranteed. Why? Because the perception is it will cost too much, even though we'll pay for the disasters after that again and again and again, like we, like, you know, we, we did during COVID. Um, and, uh, that I don't, I'm, I'm not particularly optimistic about. Okay, we've got, um, and this is a big question from Jacqueline Hall. Um, she loves the way you write about writing and wonders if you would want to talk about the through lines in your life and work. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think you taught me how to write Jacqueline, um, or at least some, um, or in. Um, Talk about lines on the page, Libby. Um, I mean, so at some level, you know, my own, I mean, Libby's got my, my books up there. It looks like much of my life is about attention deficit disorder and an ability to stay on one thing, um, which is somewhat true. Um, but, but I mean, I have like, I've always been interested in trying to tell a story that I could really drill down. Well, one is, this is for historians, I have never been particularly interested in historiography. I have been more interested in a question, um, like why something happened and trying to figure it out and writing a book. And I remain interested in that. And so for me in this book, really the question that I was interested in was what was the relationship between the food and the disaster? things changed as I wrote it, but I was really interested in that connection. And that's what I pursued. So like the first people I interviewed were really, um, they were in the poultry business. I did a, like a lot of that before. And that's to Elizabeth's question about Hamlet. And so that that's one thing that's like a through line through what I've written is, is sort of starting with a question that's generated by interest. Um, and I have almost always written about something I could really drill down, like a, like something that I thought represented something bigger. And Hamlet's probably the best example of that, right? Um, it, I, I was really thought that I was writing about everything, like the kind of beginning I sort of say in the book, I'm writing about the beginning of now. Um, I wrote in my Atlantic City book, I was kind of, it was a place about America on steroids. Everything was kind of bloated and exaggerated. Um, so I like that kind of model. Um, I'm actually gonna try and do something different in the book I'm writing now and try and write bigger. Um, I'm, I'm trying to write a history of the public bathroom in America over a longer period of time. Um, and um, so I, I kind of have really consciously tried to imagine a different kind of project that, that wasn't about a place and sort of imagine out from it, but about a long period of time and a kind of big topic that, that, 
to see if I could could write that. And I'm, I'm not convinced I can, but um, I'm trying to work through it. And I think the other thing, and um, Jacqueline knows this and Libby knows this, is like, I, I think I, I haven't really, I think I haven't been afraid in ways to write about, um, in some ways about myself. Like I, I, I think of like every book um, of using what I knew, what I understood from just my own life and the people around me to help me understand the past. And it's been kind of for, like as a pretty productive way to think about it. And I don't think we're at least professionally trained to do that very often, but um, it's it's been helpful to me like to make sense of it through what I could see in my own eyes. Um, even though it was a real, like I never lived in a place like Hamlet, um, but, but some of the relationships were similar to relationships I understood. So um, I've tried to keep that in play like from the very beginning of writing. We are almost at the top of the hour. So I do want to give people a chance. We still have some really good uh, questions remaining and uh, Bryant uh, has graciously uh, agreed to stay just a few minutes later. It's, it's okay if you have to go, we honor your time. Uh, but if you want to hang on for just a couple more questions, then that'd be great. Uh, Libby's gonna get into those now. Um, so, it's kind of like old home week. I keep seeing these names that I recognize in the chat room, which I guess makes doing this by Zoom um, easier than if we all had to be in Asheville um, at the same time. <laughs> but um, I'm going to combine questions from Alex McCauley and Steve Kanerwitz um, that are all, uh, both about sort of the toll and the process of research and writing um, and thinking about subjects that are painful and difficult um, and ongoing um, and maybe um, strat how did you manage to do that what kind of toll does it take on you and um, I think we think of you as a historian but also as people who have to live with these projects for years on end so um, um <laughs> Well, I mean, the book that I kept near to me, like uh, next to the Eric Kleinenberg book was Janet Malcolm's book, um, The Journalist and the Murderer, um, you know, and um, I think that's a brilliant book. And, and in some ways, I guess like Alex, like I, I, maybe Steve, like I, 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 we might even talked about this before. I, I felt, I, I could live with this story. I, I was convinced it was worth telling. I was interested in it um, and that never waned. I, I felt bad a lot of the time that I was asking people to relive that story with me, right? Like that part was, and you know, it was asking them to go to a place that was really hard for them. And, and you know, I often had follow-up questions, um, that part was harder, I guess, like was almost like, you know, feeling, feeling bad, feeling guilty, um, kind of weighing the ethical decisions of what you were asking them to endure than it was kind of living with the pain of the story itself. I, I mean, I have to like, like, I, I found the book about Starbucks harder to write for all kinds of reasons, right? Like in more painful, in a lot, in a lot of ways. So um, that, the, the, the that didn't bother me. And I also thought there was a, a, a point to telling the story and that was a, a kind of easy enough to, to sustain me. Um, How have the people of Hamlet responded to your book? Or do you uh, know? I, I can just tell one story. Um, so there's not a bookstore in Hamlet. Um, the nearest bookstore to Hamlet is in Southern Pines, um, a, a golf town. Um, and when the book first came out, I did, um, an event there and at, sort of afterwards I was talking to two people from Hamlet one was a woman who from Raleigh who was thinking about writing a book about the fire and another was a guy who um, I mentioned early on in the book was one of the people I talked to early on in the book and he was um, a journalist who covered the, the fire 
And um, he also ran the local historical society. And so this woman who was writing a book said to this man, well, why don't you invite Brian to come to Hamlet to give a talk? He could do it at the depot. And he said, that's not happening. And that's sort of been the like, so I've heard from people in Hamlet. Um, I, I know that a book group read it there. Um, but I have not been overwhelmed with either praise or rebuke from, from Hamlet. Um, it, it seems like Hamlet exiles have, have um, maybe grabbed and gravitated towards the book more, but um, I would love to, I mean, I don't know. I don't know what, what would be gained in some ways by kind of doing it there. I, I guess it'd be interesting. Um, I, the, the, well, I'll tell one last, um, the mayor of the town during the fire um, used to respond to me. She does not anymore. Um, she's also taken to posting Trump memes. So I don't really know how to add all that up together. She was a moderate Democrat when the fire happened. Um, but um, I don't, she hasn't unfriended me in any social media, but she does not um, friend me back, <laughs> how you would say. So are you, uh, did I, who did I interrupt? Sorry. No. Okay. okay. So um, I wanted to, of course, say, Bryant, uh, I would love to give you a prize for mentioning uh, Janet Malcolm. <laughs> I love Janet Malcolm. The journalist and the murderer was a, uh, I host a book club at Malaprops called Crime and Politics. And of course, I'm from North Carolina. I'm from Charlotte. And so the uh, Jeffrey McDonald murder and the Camp Lejeune thing was big, but I love her writing. And I definitely yeah. think you're onto something uh, with her and anybody who wants to know about writing and perspective and voice, I think is really informed by her. And so I thank you so much for mentioning that. I also want to say as uh, someone who uh, studied history, I think labor history and particularly recent painful labor issues, even, and I say recent, even dating back to the 30s, I consider that recent and the <laughs> things that happened in Gastonia or the coal ash spill and uh, Dan River and Eden of just a few years ago. I think the, I think towns really are um, rocked and pained by those events and they're very disempowering for people. So I want to congratulate you on uh, lifting up those voices of the people who were uh, left without uh, a voice for so long. And I think that's a, a very challenging and but yet vital role for a historian. So I'm just uh, so glad that you did that. And the public restrooms, I love that idea. <laughs> but I love it. It's great. Well, I'm sure I'll hit you up when I'm done to come to come in person to Malaprof. Uh, you must, and I can't wait to the, to know the title because I'm already thinking. Be, I'll tell you right now, it will not be a pun. Um, oh, it, there okay. will be no puns in this book delivered. Um, there is a having. There's a lot of puns in bathroom writing. I am not going to write one. I've thought about ten since you said that was the next topic. So <laughs> I, I'm guilty as charged. I did that. Yes. So uh, I definitely say that, that uh, you've had so many kind shout outs. Thanks to you for your presentation, you and Libby, uh, how informative your book and your presentation has been. Uh, people are very moved uh, and very emotional about the, this subject and about the rights of people and the way they connect to the present. And so I'm so glad that we had folks from really all around the country uh, here tonight. And that's what virtual events like this one make possible. Uh, of course, we would love to all be together. Uh, in person, but uh, virtual has has its own merits and definitely uh, this is one of them. I want to thank Libby and uh, Elizabeth for being here this evening. And uh, Libby, do you uh, want to have anything else? Nope, she, she was like, no, no, don't have anything else to say. I just Brian, want to thank you for hosting this and let me be part of it. And thank I, everybody who um, attended. Um, tonight.
And thank you so much. It looks like uh, I've got just a few more thank yous and fabulous conversation. Great questions, Libby. Uh, timely and important. Um, I want to say that it's uh, because of authors like you all that Malaprops has thrived over these 38 years. And even though we have to do it virtually, it still touches people. It still moves them uh, to want to know more about uh, the past and how it informs their actions in the present. So thank you all so much. If you are interested in Bryant's book, uh, Hamlet, then you can purchase that book at Malaprops or at your local bookstore. And we always appreciate you choosing uh, local. And uh, we look forward to our next event with you all. So get to writing. Okay, get to get get the pen to paper, Bryant, if you want to do right. it old school. <laughs> okay, that's fine. We love that. And I'm gonna start drinking before the debate. Um. Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, steady as she goes, though. Steady as she goes. I want to thank UNC Press uh, for another wonderful event and Stephanie for her help uh, behind the scenes, a director of author events, and Elizabeth, again, always a, a stalwart author and supporter of Malaprops. And we uh, hope to see you in the future. Thank you all, everybody, and good night. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Lib.